Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to uh, to welcome you here this morning. I was thinking as I was driving up, uh, the governor has COVID under control, and now he comes to Plymouth to learn about mosquitoes. Uh, there is no less no rest for the weary. But we're very proud of this organization and what Plymouth County Mosquito Control has done, because we know that we're now in that uh, season. Uh, the governor certainly does not need an introduction or the lieutenant governor, so I want to just take a, a minute and say to the governor and the lieutenant governor, thank you for everything that you have done since March. Uh, sometimes when you're out in the cities and towns, you feel a bit lonely and you wonder, you know, what are the next steps? But with our state delegation that is well represented here today, uh, the governor's uh, administration, the lieutenant governor, uh, we have been, and the best way I can put it, been taken care of. Uh, you've given us clear direction. It certainly is, is proving itself out, and we're extremely proud of the work that you've done. So, Governor, as I've said to you before many times since you've been in office, welcome to Plymouth, and we're very pleased to have you here, and certainly pleased that you're our governor during this crisis time. Thank you. Thank you, and, and good morning, and um, I know I speak for the Lieutenant Governor and myself when I say how much we appreciate uh, this opportunity to talk today about something maybe other than COVID. Um, and I want to thank you, Ken, as well, for all the work that you do here. Um, and I also want to thank the Plymouth County Mosquito Control District um, and, and Superintendent Ross Rossetti for, for your work. Um, this is something that falls into the category of if I made a list of the sort of top 10 things that I knew nothing about when I became governor that I know far too much about now, uh, this would be on the list. But that's in part because of how important it is. And um, you'll hear in a few minutes from Environmental Affairs Secretary Katie Theoridis and from Public Health Commissioner Monica Burrell, who I think we'll do a far better job of making the case with respect to why this is so important. But I can tell you this, that um, Triple E is, uh, is very real, it's very dangerous, and the work that's done uh, by many of the control districts around the Commonwealth, including this one, makes an enormous difference in keeping people healthy and safe uh, during the course of the summer. Um, but before I get to that, I do need to say uh, a word or two about COVID. Um, yesterday, over 7,700 uh, COVID-19 tests were reported across the state. That brings our total number of tests to about 1.2 million that have been administered since the beginning of this. Yesterday, there were 157 new positive cases, which brings the total statewide number of positive cases to about 104,000. The seven-day average for the positive test rate remains at about 1.8%. That's a 94% de decrease from the middle of April. There are currently just over 600 patients that are hospitalized for COVID-19 statewide, and as of yesterday, fewer than 100 people are in the ICU for COVID-19 across Massachusetts. The three-day average on the number of patients is down about 83% since the middle of April. Um, the number of folks in the ICU because of COVID is down about 90% since then, and only one hospital is currently reporting that they're still using surge capacity to serve patients. We saw similar numbers across the holiday weekend as well, and the public health data continues to show us positive trends on many of the key metrics. So far, uh, Massachusetts has managed to reopen in many ways while continuing to do the things that everybody needs to do to contain the virus. And I think as yesterday, uh, most people know, we officially entered phase three of our reopening process. I do want to give a special thanks to uh, Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito uh, for her leadership on this issue, um, balancing and wrestling through all of the issues that are associated with reopening in Massachusetts on a phase basis uh, is an extraordinarily difficult task. And um, over the course of 
uh, about a month and a half, I would say she probably, along with her reopening advisory board and with Economic Affairs Secretary Mike Keneally, probably met with uh, something north of uh, folks and organizations that represented well north of a thousand employers and significantly more than a million employees here in Massachusetts. And I think it's a tribute to the discipline and to the commitment to the data that she and her team brought to this that we are where we are, just beginning phase three here in Massachusetts and still retaining some very low and importantly low uh, statistics with respect to COVID generally. So thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for your work on this. Um, it's now more important than ever, especially as we get into phase three, that everybody continue to do the things that have made such a difference here in Massachusetts over the course of the past 120 days. That means continuing to wear masks if you can't socially distance, to socially distance whenever possible, to practice good hygiene, and to stay home uh, if you feel sick, and to make sure that you take advantage of things like telehealth and many of the other uh, things that have been put up either through our executive orders or by providers to make sure that you're in contact um, with your clinicians uh, and your practitioners if you're concerned about your health status. Um, we continue to make positive progress on the reopening, but obviously it's going to be critically important for us to understand that COVID does not take a summer vacation and we all need to continue to do the things that have made such a big difference here in Massachusetts over the course of the past three or four months. Now with respect to Triple E preparedness, uh, for the first past few months we've obviously been spending a lot of our time on COVID, uh, but Triple E remains an enormously important public health issue here in the Commonwealth of Mass. Eastern equine encephalitis is a rare but serious disease that spread to people through bites of an infected mosquito. Most years there are very few cases of Triple E in Massachusetts, but every few years there are outbreaks with higher number of cases. We saw one of those uh, just last summer. During the 19, uh, 2019 season, there were 12 human cases of Triple E and six people died from those infections. And it's important to keep in mind that Triple E outbreaks typically last two or three years. That means that we can expect the 2020 season to feature a high number of cases again. Our administration has been planning for the 2020 season and has taken a number of steps to protect people and communities from Triple E. In a minute, uh, Environmental Affairs Secretary Theoridis will talk about our early spring preparations, including larviciding, spraying, and horse vaccinations. I'm especially looking forward to that part. And uh, DPH Commissioner Monica Burrell will talk about surveillance testing that's currently underway and has already yielded specimens that are positive for Triple E in certain parts of Massachusetts. She'll also discuss the DPH public awareness campaign, which is encouraging everybody to take the kinds of steps, once again, that you can take individually uh, to protect yourselves. In addition to these steps, the administration filed legislation earlier this year to enable a more effective statewide approach to combating Triple E. Many cities and towns have access to critical surveillance and resources as part of their membership in a mosquito district control program. This is probably one of the reasons why we're here is because Plymouth County has done such a fine job on that. In a minute, Acting Superintendent Ross Rossetti will talk about the steps that they are taking locally here in Plymouth County and their important ones that do make year over year an enormous difference in making the people in this community and this county safer. However, there are many cities and towns in Massachusetts that don't ben benefit from membership in a mosquito control district. And in these parts of Massachusetts, there is no entity, state, regional, or local, that can engage in what we would call the typical, traditional mosquito control activities. And while a town-by-town -town approach might be okay for an average year of Triple E, when you have a two or three year outbreak like what we're dealing with now, it really does require a different approach. Mosquitoes and viruses obviously don't pay much attention to city or town lines. The public health risks of mosquito-borne viruses such as Triple E present and require a coordinated and unified approach on a statewide basis. The legislation that we filed with the legislature, which 
I do anticipate and hope uh, will find its way through the legislature shortly and get to our desk will allow the experts at the Department of Public Health and the State Reclamation and Mosquito Board to work together proactively to protect public health across the Commonwealth. When DPH determines that there is an elevated risk, the experts in mosquito control at the State Reclamation and Mosquito Board Control Board may take necessary actions to mitigate that risk. We've had productive conversations, as I said, with our colleagues in the legislature since we filed this bill in April, and we hope that we can work together to get this issue done soon. Passing the bill will be an important addition to existing efforts around spraying, surveillance, testing, and public awareness that are already underway in many parts of Massachusetts. The simplest way I can describe this is to say that um, most of the places that have mosquito control districts in Massachusetts are the places where historically we've seen Triple E outbreaks. One of the reasons why we believe it's important to create a more statewide approach to this is because over the course of the past several years, and last year especially for the first time, we saw outbreaks in parts of Massachusetts we'd never seen before. And that was driven in large part by the changing migratory patterns of many of the birds that infect mosquitoes, who then infect people. And when we talk about a two or three year outbreak, um, the likelihood that the second year of the outbreak would take place in many of the places that the first year of the outbreak took place um, wasn't a sure thing, but it was certainly something that I think many of us expected and anticipated. And not surprisingly, the first case of Triple E that was picked up by the DPH surveillance lab was actually in Orange, Massachusetts, which is again sort of a new location with respect to where Triple E um, is located and there is not a mosquito control district there. So part of this is about dealing with the fact that as the virus, not COVID, as the Triple E virus uh, migrates a bit, as birds and mosquitoes migrate, it's important that we think a little more about this as a statewide issue and not so much on the particular areas where we've always focused on it, where historically have been the places where we've typically seen the biggest outbreaks associated with Triple E. And with that said, I will turn the podium over to Secretary Theoridis. Thank you, Governor, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you to the Town of Plymouth and to the Plymouth County Mosquito Control District for hosting us today and for all of the great work you're doing on this, on this virus. I'm pleased to join you all in Plymouth today to talk about the important work that is being done to prepare for and mitigate the threat to public health presented by mosquito-borne illnesses like Eastern equine encephalitis and West Nile virus. Last year's mosquito season resulted in Triple E cases and several tragic deaths throughout the Commonwealth, as the governor noted. Over the past nine months, Massachusetts has been taking important steps to prepare for another outbreak of Triple E through our work with the State Reclamation and Mosquito Control Board and our work with mosquito control districts and projects throughout the Commonwealth. The administration has focused not just on preparing to respond to heightened public health risk from Triple E, but also to improve upon our mitigation tools for pro proactively reducing mosquito populations that spread the disease. This spring, we started early, even, the midst, even in the midst of the COVID-19 surge. Larva siting applications were conducted by regional mosquito control districts targeting almost 20,000 acres in 110 member communities for treatment in 10 counties from the Berkshires to Cape Cod. These larva siting operations targeted the specific mosquito species that drive the triple E disease cycle. These operations were performed using helicopters or a fixed wing aircraft for aerial applications and by hand using backpack sprayers throughout April and May. And it's really important to get this done during the early season so we can tar target the larva of mosquitoes. Regional mosquito control districts have also coordinated to conduct field trials using three different larvaciding products to study the effectiveness of early spring treatments. This research will help to expand available tools to reduce the risk of mosquito-borne illness transmission, and we look forward to the results of these important studies. Additionally, we have implemented an accelerated schedule for mosquito collections submitted for virus testing for 2020 with DPH to get testing results earlier in the year throughout the season and earlier in the week. The data we collect on mosquito populations through mosquito testing for Triple E and West Nile, Nile virus and the determination of risk levels will drive our decision making for the appropriate mosquito control interventions. 
This important work is happening now. Truck mounted spraying, such as the equipment you're seeing here, using adult deciding products started in early June and continues now. These operations will run through the end of August into the first week of September while we continue to monitor the mosquito testing data from the Department of Public Health and Commissioner Burrell will speak more to that. One of the tools we need to expand this type of proactive work, as the governor mentioned, across the state and not just within mos mosquito control districts is the triple E legislation that the governor filed in April. This legislation would allow essential preventative activities such as spring larviciding to be conducted in areas that were triple E hotspots last year that may again be at high or critical risk but may not be part of a mosquito control district. The goal of this legislation is to allow enough proactive work early in the season targeting these hotspots in order to actually prevent broader aerial spraying later in the season that we had to resort to last year. We thank the legislature for their collaboration through the and, and look forward to the passage of this legislation um, and urge quick work on this so we can start to get these efforts out across the state. I also do need to remind horse owners across the state uh, to vaccinate their horses against triple E. Horse owners should be aware that triple E is spread by mosquitoes and causes fatal neurologic diseases in horses and we're lucky to have a vaccine available for horses. Um, last year, triple E led to the death of eight horses in Massachusetts. As I said, there's an effective vaccine for horses. Um, there is not, unfortunately, a treatment or vaccine available for humans. Triple E, as the governor said, is a very serious disease that can affect people of all ages in every region across Massachusetts. I think as we continue on our proactive work early in the summer um, and continuing to monitor the data, it's important that we all remain personally vig vigilant against the risk of the mosquito-borne illness as well. Spraying, spraying for mosquitoes does not eliminate the risk of triple E transmission and we ask the public to continue to follow personal protection practices that Commissioner Burrell will detail in a moment. I'd like to thank the Department of Public Health, the State Reclamation Mosquito Control Board, the Department of Agricultural Resources and the mosquito control districts across the Commonwealth for their partnership in tackling this significant challenge and for their work under more con difficult conditions this spring. We look forward to even stronger collaboration as we enter the peak mosquito season. Now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Monica Burrell. Commissioner Burrell. Good morning. It's very nice to see you all wearing your masks and socially distanced. I appreciate being here. Sorry, I had to get that in, Governor. Um, um, and we appreciate um, all of our colleagues in Plymouth for hosting us here and for all the excellent work you're doing in mosquito control. I'd also like to thank uh, the good governor, lieutenant governor, and secretary for your immense leadership on this very important public health issue. As you've heard, and we all remember, 2019 was a very active triple E season for us here in Massachusetts. And although the world has changed in many different ways since 2019, it's important for us to now get back to thinking about triple E and the preventive measures we all need to take. 2019 was our most active year since the 1950s. There were 12 human cases and unfortunately six deaths related to triple E and nine animal cases here in the Commonwealth. Here in 2020, we've already seen and reported out evidence of triple E in Massachusetts. This is considered quite early for triple E. In fact, July 1st is the earliest that triple E has been found in mosquitoes in the last 20 years. Yesterday, we've confirmed triple E in a mosquito sample collected on July 5th in the community of Wendell in Franklin County. Increase, that increased the risk levels of Tripoli to moderate in the communities of both Wendell and New Salem. On Friday, our state's first de detection of Tripoli and mosquitoes was also found in Franklin, Co Franklin County, and that increased the risk level to moderate in the communities of Orange and Athol. No human or animal cases of Tripoli have been detected yet this year. We know that tw the 2020 season is likely to be an active one as Tripoli e tends to run in two to three year cycles. So the Department of Public Health has been working since the end of the last season with our partners, as you've heard, to plan and prepare for this season. One aspect of our preparation focuses on mosquito surveillance. 
DPH is adding trapping locations, as you've heard, expanding our surveillance efforts, and we're working with mosquito control projects to reduce the timing between the trapping and the testing. We've significantly expanded the number and geographic coverage of mosquito traps for the surveillance purpose purposes. And the positive mosquito samples that we just reported on comes from one of these expanded, expanded surveillance trap sites. So we are stepping up our surveillance this season and stepping up the accuracy and rap rapidity with which we provide that information so that, again, we can use a data-driven approach to address this public health issue. We are also stepping up our communication and education efforts as well. This season, when it comes to public messaging, we're starting earlier and we're doing more messaging. We've launched a new website and a robust public awareness campaign. You can see some of those posters here today. Um, you'll be seeing new, updated, and multimedia materials that include videos, booklets, posters. We're doing outreach with print materials and providing assistance and education materials to local health, schools, camps, sports leagues, and other groups. The key to our message is about taking personal protective measures. You'll see these ads on TV, digital streaming, and they're already up on social media. In addition, there'll be enhanced messaging with electronic highway signs and DOT billboards. We've, unva we've unveiled as well a new user-friendly website this season, which I hope you'll go and take a look at. It's mass.gov, mosquitoes and ticks. Here you'll find the facts, protective measures, materials, videos, and the state risk maps that we've been talking about today. We also rely heavily on you, our colleagues in media, to spread the word. Last season, we issued dozens of press releases and media advisories, held press conferences, and did over 100 media interviews. The goal of this all is to raise awareness for our residents about the role that each one of us can play in personal protection from mosquitoes. And these include using mosquito repellents with an EPA-registered active ingredient, wearing long sleeves and long pants to reduce exposed skin, and being aware of mosquito activity around you. We've all been spending a lot of time indoors related to COVID-19, and we want the residents of Massachusetts to go outside and enjoy outdoor time with their families. But just like we asked you to take precautions against the other virus that causes COVID, we ask you to take enhanced precautions against triple E so that we can protect ourselves and continue to enjoy the outdoors. Thank you very much. I'll hand it over to the superintendent now. Thank you, Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor, for being here today. At Plymouth County Mosquito Control, our goal is to reduce the risk of mosquito-borne diseases through science-based methods and a year-round proactive approach with limited environmental impacts. In late fall and winter months, to reduce habitat for immature mosquitoes, our crews conduct water management projects to clear blockages from drainage ditches. In Plymouth County, over 65,000 feet of drainage ditches were cleaned and maintained last year. In addition, we have a tire removal and recycling program that has surpassed 10,000 tires in the last three years. These are collected from residents' properties and wetlands to reduce habitat for container breeding mosquitoes that may carry West Nile virus. In the springtime, we focus on targeting mosquitoes in their larval stage, which is found in standing water. Treating mosquitoes at this stage is the most effective way to reduce the overall mosquito population. Plymouth, uh, the project owns and operates an airplane used to conduct our aerial larva sighting operations. Over 15,000 acres of swamp in Plymouth and Bristol County were treated using a biological larvicide. Simultaneously, our crews are out monitoring hundreds of identified breeding sites along with over 50,000 catch basins that will be tested and treated as necessary. Now with summer here and adult mosquitoes out, uh, out flying, our trapping and surveillance is in full swing. Annually, 100,000 mosquitoes from Plymouth County are collected and identified here in our lab. As part of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health surveillance program, 20,000 of those mosquitoes are tested for viruses. Truck-based ultra-low volume spraying for adult mosquitoes began on June 1st. Spraying takes place between 2 a.m. and sunrise to avoid beneficial pollinators such as bees that are active during the day. We recently purchased new truck spraying equipment 
that will allow us to more efficiently treat large outdoor areas where people gather, such as sports fields. Whenever viruses are detected, we respond by following the Massachusetts Arbovirus Surveillance and Response Plan, which may include truck-based area or town-wide spraying, as well as additional trapping and larva siding in the affected area. Given the cyclical nature of Triple E, we've taken many proactive steps to prepare for a potentially active season. We're ready to work closely with local and state officials to protect our communities from mosquito-borne diseases. I'd like to thank Governor Baker for highlighting this important issue. I'd also like to thank the State Mosquito Reclamation and Mosquito Control Board, the Plymouth County Mosquito Control Commissioners, and a special thanks to the office staff and field crews here in Plymouth and across the Commonwealth for their diligence and dedication during this busy season. And I think Governor Baker will be taking questions now. Thank you, Ross. Questions on this? COVID really didn't affect the planning on this, primarily because uh, this stuff was well underway um, pretty much as soon as the season ended last year. And, uh, and I can't emphasize how important it is for, um, for people to pay attention to their local communities, and if you have a control district, to the messaging coming from them with respect to what's going on. I mean, I, I know last summer seems like hell. February seems like a long time ago. but. Um, if you think back to last summer, um, when we were in the midst of the Tripoli outbreak we had last summer, I mean, there were a lot of people all over the Commonwealth who were paying an enormous amount of attention to what was being said uh, by their local officials, by state officials, by public health folks, and by the folks in the Mosquito Control Districts we had about what the status around Tripoli e was. Um, if, if there's a big outbreak, it can be a really big deal and a big issue. I think what I would say about messaging generally is, is we've tried to be pretty consistent and I think we've gotten tremendous help from our colleagues in the medical community and our colleagues in local government and our colleagues in the legislature who are here and other electeds that if you can't distance, wear a mask, um, distance wherever you can, hygiene really matters, disinfectant, I mean take seriously this idea about um, the contagiousness associated with COVID. And, there are a lot of things that people can do as individuals to help fight and contain the virus and stop the spread. And I would argue with respect to uh, Tripoli, e, there are more often than not things that people can do uh, to deal with this. As the commissioner, um, as the commissioner said, you know, if you're going to be out in the woods or, or walking out in places where you anticipate there are a lot of mosquitoes, wear a pretty significant um, bug spray, and if you can wear long sleeves or long pants, go for it. Um, and recognize and understand, especially if we get into the part of the summer where the outbreaks get more intense, um, I do think a lot of people will stop uh, doing evening activities because that's obviously the point in time in which mosquitoes are typically most present. Um, but I, I really hope that people understand that uh, we do think it's important for people to be outside. We've been saying people should be outside since March. Um, the sun is a very important part of um, sort of happiness and, and, um, and, and positivity for us and for people. And I, I love the fact that the parks have been full um, for a long time now. But, um, but once again, I mean, I think our key message in this is we will do the things that we can do as government entities working together with our colleagues in the private sector um, to limit the exposure and the outbreak associated with Triple E. And if and our colleagues in the legislature get this legislation passed, that will make it easier for us to deal with some of the places for which this is a new thing. Um, but there are a lot of things people can do uh, as individuals. Um, and, if, and if we're all smart about this, we can really limit the impact. Yeah. What are the projections for this year? I know we're in the middle of a two-year uh, cycle right now, but are we looking at the same level as last year, higher, lower? That's not one I can speak to. 
So I'm looking at the two experts over here. Go ahead. So if you look at, so this question about um, what's this year going to look like, um, so we really can't speculate about what the year will look like. What we can do is we can look back at the patterns that we've seen in the past. And what we've seen from previous years is that Tripoli tends to be in two to three year cycles. And that's why at the end of last season, we began right away planning for this next season, assuming that we may see Tripoli in high numbers again. Of course, we can't predict how many cases. Luckily, it remains to be a rare disease, but very serious. Um, so we can't say the exact numbers, but if previous cycles are any sign, this may be another active year. Other questions? So um, I guess what I would say is, first of all, um, we expect and anticipate each time we move to a new phase um, that there will be some bumpiness. There has been every single time in phase one, step one, and phase one, step two, and phase two, step one. Um, and, I, and I wish there was some way to avoid the bumpiness. Um, unfortunately, uh, I, I think because a lot of the guidance is pretty detailed and pretty specific. Um, I think it requires uh, a few days for people to absorb it and understand it. And, and, and if people felt that, uh, that this guidance was late in arriving, um, that, that's certainly on us. Um, with respect to the rules generally, uh, we, and I should let the Lieutenant Governor add to this, we spend a lot of time talking to our colleagues in other states about the guidance uh, that they're developing, who they're talking to, and and how they're framing what they're doing and, and have incorporated in many cases um, the guidance that we develop with the input that uh, we get from our colleagues in other states. And, and what I've ultimately concluded is that um, there are different things on which every state is more strict or less strict than other states. But typically uh, what people focus on, and it's totally understandable, is the circumstances and the particulars in their state on their issue where their state is more aggressive than another. But generally speaking, you know, it's one of these when you look at the actual layout of how different people have chosen to pursue this stuff. And some of it also just depends on um, whether or not there is um, a, um, a robust dialogue that takes place between and among the public health folks and whichever particular part of the uh, of the economy we're working on. Um, and generally speaking, that also has something to do with why some of this takes a little longer, because we work that hard. And I think I should let the Lieutenant Governor speak to that issue. Uh, as we all know, uh, phase three of step one began on uh, yesterday. And as part of the opening of phase three, the guidance relative to youth and amateur sports activity was updated. Uh, this is a, a challenging area, but like uh, industry reopening, uh, sports also has levels of play as well as an assessment of risk associated with the individual sport activity. Uh, much of what we've learned comes from what's happening in other states, uh, comes from the CDC, and there's actually a national association of high school uh, sports that we've also looked to for some guidance. Uh, many of the states that are opening sports have bucketed them in terms of low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. Uh, you see that in the guidance that we issued yesterday and also talked about level of play. Level one being uh, a, a practice with distance on the field, which was part of phase two. Uh, level two, allowing more play intra-team, so teammates playing one another. And a level three being inter-team, so two different teams coming together. And level four being tournament play, where teams come from out of state and within a region. Uh, the guidance yesterday is for summer sports uh, only, and it takes into consideration the level of play and the risk associated with the sport. Uh, we are also uh, working with officials in uh, the sports community 
as well as the medical community and have organized an internal work group with, along with our professionals uh, inside government uh, to study what's happening elsewhere and determine uh, what the next steps can be uh, for, uh, for the current summer, but more so looking at the fall and seeing what can be developed for fall sports. Thank you. Just one PS on that. Um, all three of my kids played high school sports. Two of them played college. And the Lieutenant Governor's kids both play high school sports. Um, we are acutely aware of how important uh, sports are to kids. And, um, and we're also acutely aware that uh, people who have not respected the virus um, on a number of issues since the beginning of this uh, pandemic have paid a really terrible price. And it's very hard to put the genie back in the bottle, which is why we've tended to be pretty careful about how we've gone about dealing with a lot of this stuff. Pardon me? Sorry, uh, I said yesterday that students, international students come to college, if colleges go completely online, they would not be able to return to the U.S. I guess what's your message to the Massachusetts universities or international students that go to school here? Yeah, I think the, the key question on this one is, uh, is risk measurement. And, um, and I actually think on there are certain issues where we've made decisions to not make a decision at this point in time because we believe there is time to, to process and engage and discuss and learn more. And as the Lieutenant Governor just said, the guidance that was issued with respect to youth sports was for summer sports. Um, I think a lot of the stuff associated with college, I mean, we're still in pretty deep conversations here in Massachusetts with colleges just about what the rules of the game and the playing field are going to look like. And I guess what I would say is I think that decision was, was premature. Um, that said, I do think you're going to see um, countries take um, some very cautious positions with respect to travel, uh, international travel generally. I mean, we're no longer uh, allowed to fly uh, and visit many places in Europe. Um, so, I mean, I just think the, the whole issue around the pandemic has created a continually changing sense about, um, about rules and about um, and the application of those rules. And they affect travel at uh, at a local level, they affect travel at a global level, and um, and I I guess the way I think about this is um, people ought to make the decisions they need to make at the time they need to make them with the best information they have. I think this one was a little premature. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you all, you're aware a Plymouth business owner has filed suit against you with, with, with relation to COVID-19, and I wonder if you had comments about that. I mean, generally speaking, we don't speak to um, to, to legal engagements people have with the Commonwealth one way or the other. Um, I would just say that um, I get the fact that there are many things associated with managing our way through COVID at the same time we are trying to create opportunities for people to work and pay their bills and pay their rent, um, create some, um, some awkward and difficult moments. And, um, and there we try to follow the best guidance and the best science that's out there. And I'll tell you something, the one thing everybody for the most part agrees on in a world where many people don't agree on a lot of things is that if two people are wearing a mask, the likelihood of a transmission drops precipitously. And if the number one objective we all have with respect to dealing with COVID is to reduce the spread of the virus, because that in the end is how you contain it and ultimately kill it, um, and this is one of the most effective things that we can all do to keep ourselves, our friends, our neighbors, our families, uh, our coworkers safe. Uh, I think it's perfectly appropriate for us to expect people to step up and wear a mask um, when they're out in public. Thank you.